Chris and I were both um, class of 2012, um, and uh, um, since I graduated, I've been working um, freelance in New York, um, and uh, I started in the camera department uh, as an assistant cameraman on two seasons of The Apprentice, um, and uh, I've since moved primarily into production sound. Um, uh, after doing it on a, on a documentary, I kind of fell into it, and, and I found that I really enjoyed it. And um, after putting together a small kit, started taking some jobs, and, and uh, things clearly spiraled well out of control. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, um, but it, it's been great, um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Troy, for having us. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, I, I grew up, yeah, 2012, Media Center alum. Um, I was a part of the LCST program, which is no longer a thing here. Uh, it's been grouped with the film. Uh, now there's actually a film major, which is really cool. Um, so it's awesome that that exists. Um, I, I got started uh, in post-production, actually, which is not where I expected to end up. Um, I uh, started at Discovery Studios as an assistant editor, and I did that for a couple years, actually, and just sort of got on the wheel of uh, a few different shows. But I was, I, you know, I, I had always wanted to transition into production, and uh, eventually I landed on uh, hoarding Buried Alive as a technical production coordinator. And my job was basically to send camera crews all around the country um, their camera packages. And we, we had in-house cameras that I maintained and, uh, you know, we just ship them. Even though, like, I think the only international shit that we had was in Canada, so it was that. Um, but after that, I met some really great shooters. Um, they come in, they, they, they sort of brought me into the fold. I, I got to go out to the field with them. And from that point on, I was like, okay, I wanna, I wanna do camera stuff. And uh, so for the last year and a half, um, that, that is basically all, all, all that I've done. So I'm a freelance camera assistant and operator living in DC. And uh, that is me. Yeah, throw it to Ted. I'm Ted Hogeman, I graduated in 2009. I actually got my start in film doing movies like 24 Speed in the Media Center. Um, and it just was sort of a hobby of mine. I did lots of short films after college as well. Um, and I actually had trouble finding people to do sound for me. And sort of ended up falling into production sound that way. And I've been freelance for about a year in DC. Worked on four feature films, including with both of these guys. Um, it was, it's been a really exciting time, and it's a lot of fun. All right. So I, uh, I just want to interject here. So. Uh, we're, we're in for a treat here. One of the things that uh, you, you guys know uh, when you're shooting video or making works, that often the sound is the missing link. And uh, we're super fortunate to have some expertise uh, here to help us navigate uh, uh, how to get good sound and what are some of the challenges with that. So um, looking forward to this. All right. gonna, I think I'm going to learn a lot. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so we'll, we'll kick it off. Um, Thank you, uh, Troy. Thank you to you know, the whole staff at the Media Center for hosting us and, and to the Global Film Festival um, for organizing the weekend. Um, and then uh, we are also sponsored here. The, the um, filmmaking workshop today is sponsored by Gotham Sound and Sound Devices. And a huge thank you to both of them. Um, they've sent a ton of free stuff it's in the back. Please take your fill. It's it's all really cool stuff. We're also doing a little raffle on um, three uh, sound devices, um, power banks, portable chargers. So make sure you get a raffle ticket. Um, all right. So um, getting into the presentation. So this is the essentials of production sound. So the what what I'm hoping to to teach you today is the core concepts of sound mixing. Um, this is going to be um, basic principles that are often overlooked, um, but are really universal anytime we're recording audio, um, be it for production, which is where we're going to focus, but even for music. Um, and, and so focusing on what is sound, what are, what are our goals when we're recording sound, and, and how does that work in a digital environment and in a production environment. So um, the first thing is uh, just a, a really general question. What's the difference between hearing and listening? And I'm going to open that up to you. So what do you think would be the difference between hearing and listening? 
I work as a tour guide, and my boss once said that you know when people say they can't hear you, they can actually hear what you're saying. They just can't understand what you're saying. So I think there's sort of a difference between that. Like your your ear registers something, but maybe doesn't really fully comprehend it or can't. So something like that. That's that's where I'm, my my brain went. Okay. So intelligibility. Yeah. Clarity. Okay. Anything else? Listening is more like active hearing. You have to think about what you're hearing and and put thoughts to it instead of just letting it be like given to you. Right, exactly. So, so hearing is passive and listening is active. Um, another word that we'll often use is critical. We'll, we'll, we will listen to something critically and that doesn't mean that we're judging it, uh, but that means that we are being critics of what we're listening to. We, we are um, making a decision and paying attention to the, uh, to the qualities, to the dynamics, uh, to the intelligibility. Is it clear? Is it noisy? And that's our responsibility as the sound mixer. Um, and, and hopefully you will see that um, there's so much more than holding the boom, which I know no one wants to do. Um, but sometimes that can lead to a pretty good career. So um, what is classic picture? So we have, uh, it's very easy for us to say, okay, what, what is a classic picture? So again, I'll, I'll open that up to you. When you think of a classic picture, what do you think of? So here's, here's something that we could call a classic picture. Um, so uh, School of Athens, balance, color, um, we see rule of thirds, uh, you know, we can divide this up, we can see the sections, and I think we could all kind of look at this and say, all right, this is a classic picture. Um, and uh, similarly, girl with the pearl earring. Um, so again, something that we can all look at and say, all right, this is right. And when we look at it, we see what's right about it. We see the color, we see the light, and we see um, the framing. Um, and going into cinema, again, we see balance. Um, and then um, moving on, we see rule of thirds. We see balance. Uh, we see the framing. These are all concepts that we do all the time, that, that we know. Um, but I'm going to ask you now, what is classic sound? Would it, it would be uh, sound that is uh, unmitigated uh, by uh, ambient sound, okay. or sound minus that. Okay. So, so we're hearing our source, what, what, what we want to hear without any noise or pollution behind it. Okay. Um, and then um, what about like sound qualities? Would anyone have an idea about like a, like a quality of sound? So. Like how loud it is. Yeah. Like right, yeah. right. How loud it is, um, how soft it is, again, how clear it is. Um, and so we can look at um, some words that we use in sound and, and how they relate to qualities. And so we, we can talk about the frequency. And that you know, is the pitch. So we could say, is it low or high? That's a quality of sound. Um, we'll talk about amplitude or the volume. Is it soft or loud? Um, reverb. Does the room echo? We can walk into a room. We can clap. Do we hear it echo? Um, and we can hear, if I turn around and I, I speak into a corner, you can hear how muffled my voice becomes. And that, again, is a quality of sound. Um, so what, what might bad sound be? What, what I'm really trying to get to is that, um, that sound is very defined. Every time we talk about you know, what, are, what are we really trying to do when we record sound, we keep coming back to the same things. We want to hear clearly what the subject is that, that we're trying to record. We don't want any noise behind it. We don't want pollution. pollution. We don't want the air conditioner. And, um, and it, it's very straightforward. The goal of recording sound is fairly universal. Um, we can all agree on what a classic picture is. We all know that there's, we're looking for balance and we're looking for tone and, 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 and we're looking for a pretty picture. But that can also get subjective. 
And so what is a good looking picture to me might be a terrible looking picture to you. But if we're going to listen to something, odds are we're all going to have the same opinion. And so that goal of what we're trying to get to, um, to get technical, is called a high signal to noise ratio. And so where the signal is the desired audio source, and that may be talent, that may be ambient sound effect, um, but the, the actual subject and the noise is whatever the background is. So we want to have the highest signal to the lowest noise. Um, noise can be background locations, it can be handling noise when you're holding the boom, if you're shaking the boom, or your hands are going up and down the boom, or it can be clothing noise. I'm wearing a lab right now, and right now, I just added noise. Uh, so uh, it can also be electronic noise. You may hear when you, when you put your headphones on and you're listening to your mixer or your camera, you may hear like a background hum. And it may be that you set your input level too high and now you've introduced electronic noise and you need to lower it back down. When we talk about sound mixing, um, if I could do just one sentence, what is sound mixing, um, it is, Sound mixing is the job of matching what you hear to what you see. Um, there's no sense in overcomplicating it. Uh, we so often pick up the microphone and we're dealing with wireless and we think, okay, well, how, how am I going to do this? What am I really trying to do? And, and it's just making it sound like how it looks. It's as simple as that. Um, and that was something that I didn't really think of for a while. Uh, when, I, when I started working as a sound mixer. And then um, I, I was told that by someone and it was really pretty groundbreaking and it was so obvious, um, but I had never thought of it that way before. So going into basics of recording, so we think of the, the chain of sound. Where does sound originate from? And it originates from your performer. Sound is physics. Uh, sound, your performer speaks, his vocal cords vibrate, and moves molecules, uh, ener energy through the air. Um, that ultimately gets recorded, it passes through the microphone to the mixer, um, and ultimately we're going to watch it at home. Um, so if we think about the first link in the chain, that's acoustic energy. Um, so we have uh, the uh, sound energy is compressing the air as a wave. Um, and we have, um, and so now when we think about human hearing, um, we hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, or 20 kilohertz. Um, and uh, I'll send this to Troy, anyone who wants to look at these slides in more detail, you can. Um, but uh, generally, um, we see low frequencies to high frequencies. Um, amplitude is volume, loudness, human speech being at around 60 dB, pain being at, um, uh, or, or uh, the danger level being at 140 dB. Um, threshold of pain is around 130. Um, and so the ear and the brain are the best microphone we have. We, there, there is no perfect microphone, but the closest thing is the ear and the brain. And the perfect microphone would have what we would refer to as a flat, a flat frequency response. Uh, meaning that at every frequency that the mic records, it's recording at the same sensitivity. Um, but that typically can't happen. It's, we can't manufacture something as good as our ear. Um, and so we look, we have a frequency uh, response graph um, of a Shure SM57. And if you look at that uh, with frequencies increasing from uh, left to right, we see that it bumps in the higher frequencies, which may not be so bad. Sometimes we might want that. We might have a uh, talent whose voice is very deep and, and we might want a mic that's going to bump the high frequencies. This concept called the cocktail party effect. So I'm going to ask you all to do something very simple. Just turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor how they got here today. Go ahead, just take like 10 seconds.
Okay, so, so does everyone know how your neighbor got here today? So you're able to hear your neighbor over all of the other noise. And that's what we call the cocktail party effect. That in all of the surrounding noise, the ear and the brain are able to pinpoint exactly what we want to hear and to isolate it. However, microphones are dumb. They do not have the sophistication that the brain does. And so if we were to just put a microphone in the middle of the room, all it's going to hear is noise. If we were to listen to that file played back, we're not going to know how anyone got here today. And so that's where the job of the sound mixer comes in. When we have to deal with noise and we're trying to isolate a subject, that's where we look at the tools that we have. And so, of course, the primary tool that we're all going to think of is the microphone. And so we have a few types of microphones. The most ubiquitous in film is, of course, the shotgun, the boom microphone. So the shotgun mic um, is highly directional. Um, it has excellent off-axis rejection, meaning that it's going to primarily pick up what it's pointed at while rejecting the sides and behind. And so that's one way that in a noisy environment, I could point the microphone at one of you, I could, find, I could know how you got here today, and everyone else is silenced. Um, so we use the shotgun microphone, typically outdoors. Um, because it is so narrow and so focused, if we point it at a wall, it becomes very um, susceptible to room reverb. So we try not to use them indoors. We can, but we have to be careful about it. Um, and it is a condenser type microphone, meaning that it needs 48 volts of phantom power, which we can provide from many cameras or from most mixers, generally all mixers. The next microphone that um, we would use would be the hypercardioid, which is less directional than the shotgun. Um, that's what's up on this boom over here, um, the Sennheiser MKH-50. Less directional, um, better for indoors though, because it's less susceptible to reverb. Still a condenser and still needs 48 volts of phantom power. Not the best choice for outdoors because it's going to be more susceptible to, to um, exterior noise that's going to come from off axis. Um, the next mic that we might use would be the cardioid microphone. Um, and these are all pickup patterns when we talk about um, a shotgun or, or hypercardioid or cardioid. Um, and so if we look at the capsules that are here, we see it looks like a heart. And, and that's why we call it a cardioid pattern. So we see that it's picking up in that direction and it's rejecting what's behind. Um, and so these are good choices when we're recording music, when we want a fairly open, um, open sound stage. Um, and um, uh, they can be great if you need a mic on camera, if you're shooting um, what we would call ENG style, um, electronic news gathering, with a camera on your shoulder. Um, say you have to speak to a group of people. If you had a shotgun with a very narrow pickup pattern right in front of you, and I'm trying to speak to a group of people, I'm going to have to go like this to get everyone. But a cardioid's going to be more open. It's going to get your group of people while rejecting me, the camera operator. Again, typically a, a condenser microphone, though there are some dynamics which do not require phantom power. Um, and uh, next would be the Omni. Um, and the Omni picks up from 360 degrees. Um, there is no rejection at all. Um, these are good choices, again, for music. If you had to do uh, group recording, um, say you're in one of the acapella groups and you want to put one mic in the center and everyone sings around it, then we'd use an Omni. Um, or they could be great for ambient recording or sound effects. Again, condensers or dynamics. So what about when we can't use the boom? Many reasons why we can't. Um, and uh, for that, that's when wireless comes in. So why would we, why would we use wireless? Um, booming may just be impossible um, because of the camera angle, the shot type, or the lighting might cause a shadow. There might be a lot of movement in the scene, and the boom would have to cross the lighting. 
um, or the talent might just be out of reach. Um, sometimes we'll have multiple talents. Those multiple talents might be speaking over each other. And the boom just wouldn't be able to move in time or pick them all up. Um, sometimes we also may be shooting documentary style or reality, um, where it's, we have no idea what the talent's going to do, say, or when they're going to do it. Um, they might run off. And we have the wireless to be able to keep track of them. Um, <laughs> it's very important in reality. Um, so um, these are all reasons why we might use uh, wireless. And um, uh, often, most importantly, for redundancy. Um, very often, most often, you will be booming and using a wireless. If something goes wrong, if your talent, for whatever reason, steps out of the boom, if you make a mistake with the boom, you have it covered on the wireless. And that's very important. Um, you do not want to be told by your producer. You, you don't want to have your producer ask you, hey, um, she went and did that. Did, did you cover it? And you say, nope, we didn't block for that. And that's it. It's gone. You lost the take. So redundancy is going to be a recurring theme that um, is extremely important. Um, so uh, wireless mic tips and tricks. And at this point, I would like to do a mic demo. So is there anyone who wants to get wired? Oh, All right. So um, cool. All right. So very important things. There are tons of videos on YouTube on, how, on mic placement. How to, how to do it, and that's not really what we're going to do right now. We're going over the really important stuff that people don't learn, or they learn it the hard way. Um, so the first is make sure your hands are clean. Uh, it's personal. So uh, make sure your hands are clean. Make sure your breath is good. I took an Altoid before. Sound guys have to invade people's personal space. It's a tough part of the job. It can, be, uh, it can be really intimidating. But the thing to remember is that you're a professional. This is your job. And your talent is also a professional. And it's their job to be mic'd. Now, if they have an objection to it, there, there are um, plenty of avenues to sort that out. Um, but in general, Everyone knows what they have to do. And just be confident about it and be nice. Um, so uh, hi. Hi. I'm Matthew. I'm Claire. And is it OK if I put a wireless mic on you? Yeah. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to walk my talent through what I'm doing. So this is the mic. And I'm just going to open it up. And this is a weight. So I have a few tools that make miking much easier. Um, and uh, I don't like to do my job without. Um, this is called the Lav Bullet, and it's just a weight. And it is going to help me drop the mic down the front of your shirt. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll drop the mic down the front of your shirt, and then I'm going to bring it around the back. I'm going to connect it to the transmitter, and I'll clip the transmitter on your waist. So this is just medical tape. Uh, and. I'm just going to take off a piece here. And when you're on set, make sure you leave enough time for miking. You don't want to be rushed. Um, remember that this is usually the last thing Talon is going to do before they go on set. And so it's your job to make sure that they're camera ready. And camera ready doesn't just mean they're on mic. Camera ready means that they're in a mindset to step in front of a camera. And so we don't want to do anything that's going to make them feel rushed or feel uncomfortable. All right, so I'm going to drop this down the front of your shirt. Thank you. And that comes right down. I'm going to pull the slack through. And I'm just going to tape this right here. I'm going to tape it on your shirt. Thank you. And that's off. And now this is the transmitter. Plugging this in. And if you wouldn't mind turning around for me the other way, please. Um, so I'm, I'm um, can you, your name, please? Claire. Claire. So I had Claire turn around that way because the antenna on the transmitter is on the right side. I don't want the cable to cross the antenna because if the cable crosses the antenna, 
the cable becomes the antenna. So I'm just going to clip this right here. And I'm going to take the slack in the cable, and I'm just going to tidy it up, and then tuck it away. All right. And then the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take another piece of tape. And I'm going to put a strain relief on the side of the cable. So if you wouldn't mind turning around just so that you can see. Um, so I'm going to take the cable here, okay. and I'm going to put a piece of tape on the cable, and just tape it here. So now what that does, and you are mic'd, what that does with the tape on the side is now when you move around, you're going to feel it's not pulling up here. Mm. If anything, it's going to pull down here, which is going to isolate the mic from noise. It's also going to protect your mic because those lobs are an investment. And if that pulls and breaks, it's gone. Thank you so much. Pleasure. So I'm going to take that mic off you. Major thing that I do want to talk about is um, if you ever have to wire a minor, always in the presence of a parent or guardian, um, it takes such a small misunderstanding uh, to ruin your reputation and your career. There's really no exceptions for that. Um, uh, again, all the same rules apply. Confidence, telling your talent what's going to happen, making sure the parent knows what's going to happen. Um, again, uh, I, I hate to have to talk about it, but um, it's, it's just a, a reality if you're going to make this your job. Um, OK, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, mic versus line level. Um, so I've had some of these things, uh, some, a little bit about this on slides before, um, but I just want to talk about it uh, more specifically. Um, so uh, we know that um, the, the air pressure from speech reaches the microphone. And that uh, makes a capsule inside the microphone vibrate. That vibration generates an electrical current. And, and that voltage is very, very small. And we call that, that voltage is generated from that vibration mic level. Typically, it's measured in millivolts. Um, and, we, and it's typically around minus 50 dB, uh, plus or minus about 5 dB. Um, and that mic level then, if you were to try and listen to it, you can't. It's too low to hear. It has to be amplified. And that's where we use, that's why we have a microphone preamp. So the preamp is going to increase the mic level to line level. Professional mixers and recorders, like what we have here from sound devices, um, are going to use a professional line level of 4 dB, plus 4 dB. Consumer equipment, like your home DVD player, if you still have one, um, or your laptop, um, is going to use minus 10 dB. Um, and so um, that's very important to know because what happens if we try and plug a line level source into a mic level input? We have much higher input voltage. It's not just that the level is hotter, it's that we're now trying to plug more electricity into um, a receiver that can accept it. And we can blow that out, and it can happen pretty easily. Um, so uh, that's why you may look at cameras and they have a switch next to the um, mic input that says mic line. We have to make sure that we set that correctly and, and this is the, um, the logic and, and the science behind that switch. Um, so we use decibels um, because it is a far more accessible scale um, than using voltage. Um, from mic level, we're talking millivolts, to line level, we're talking full volts. Um, and, and it's much easier to talk minus 50 to plus 4 than very small millivolts to volts. Um, so um, again, um, we have to make sure that our input is set to the correct setting. Um, otherwise, we could damage the input, or we can cause distortion and noise. Um, so when we record digital audio, um, all microphones are inherently analog devices. And in a digital world, we have to convert that to a digital signal. So that's when we use an A to D converter. 
Um, so as the user, we can choose the level of quality or the fidelity of the conversion. Um, we can choose the, uh, the sample rate. Um, and we can choose the bit depth. The sample rate is the samples per second. If we have a full sound waveform, um, we're going to take just little slices of it. And that's going to be the sample. Um, and the bit depth is going to be the dynamic range. So on a waveform, how many steps do we have um, above and below zero that we can make our amplitude? Broadcast standard is 48 kilohertz at 24 bit. And it looks something like this. Um, so uh, sample rate, if we were to imagine this as a smooth curve, we then make it digital. We take samples, and we see that it becomes choppy. So the more samples we take, the smoother that curve is, the greater the fidelity. Same thing when we come to bit depth. Um, and we're looking at the steps above and below zero. We have our original audio, 24 bit where there's going to be 12 steps above zero and 12 steps below, we still have very high fidelity. As we move down to 16-bit and then all the way down to 8-bit, like you would have on an MP3, you see we've lost a lot of information in that sound file. So when we are now going to look at what equipment we're going to use, um, we're going to say, you know, we're, we're trying to make a decision is this equipment appropriate for the project that I'm going to do? Um, if you're looking at a professional level of equipment, um, then you're going to be looking at low noise microphone preamps, meaning that we can lift that, that gain um, and get a very high signal to noise ratio. We're not going to be introducing that much noise as we increase the level. Um, we're going to have professional connections. Uh, multiple output options, which we may want if we want to send a uh, signal to the director and a separate signal to the boom operator. Um, we're going to have accurate metering, um, ergonomic controls, multiple recording options, again, for redundancy, uh, multiple power options for redundancy. If something fails, we want to be able to switch it over to a different power source. High build quality, serviceable, because this is an investment and we don't want one little piece to break and then we have to scrap the whole kit. Um, and then um, many will offer time code, which we can use for syncing, which we'll get to briefly later. Um, so uh, for example, the sound device is 633, which we have one here, as does Ted, if he wants to put his on. Um, and uh, looking at it, we see that we have um, large fader control knobs, which is going to make it very easy for us to mix on the fly. Um, we have multiple power, op and, and we have um, accurate metering. Um, we have multiple power options. On the back, we can put Sony L-style batteries. We can also um, plug in an external battery. And we can put in double A's. So this mixer will actually switch seamlessly without dropping the recording um, if one or any of those um, power sources fail. Um, and then if all of the power gets exhausted, it will take 10 seconds to close the file and shut itself down without any file corruption. Um, so that's something that's really excellent. Um, and then looking at our inputs, um, all of the inputs are locking. We have um, three mic line switchable XLR inputs. We have three line only inputs, which is great because we have six channels of inputs here. Um, we could plug in condenser microphones to these and provide phantom power as well. And the line we could use for wireless, which are typically mic line switchable. And we would want to put wireless in line because every time we go through a preamp, we run the risk of introducing noise. So if we have a source at line level already, we want to keep it there. We don't want to attenuate it down, uh, which would be stepping down the voltage, to then just bring it back up to the same level. Um, and then um, on the other side, we have multiple output options. Um, we have left, right on XLR. We have two auxiliary buses on mini XLRs. Um, and then we have a time code generator. Um, and in contrast to a very good but very different consumer or prosumer level recorder, the Zoom H4n, which probably everyone has used, um, less accurate metering. Um, the inputs are going to be 
down here, we have only two XLR inputs. We have built-in microphones. And when we see things that try and be all in one packages, we can usually assume there's going to be a corner cut somewhere, um, especially when we look at the price. We find, we get what we pay for. Um, and then uh, uh, talking about ergonomic controls, whereas the sound devices has um, these lovely knobs, the Zoom has these little switches on the side. So that's just not, it's going to make it uh, very uh, unpleasant and, and often difficult mixing experience. Um, uh, and then for power, we only have the AA input. There may be, is there an AC option? OK, so we could plug it into a wall too. But in the field, we don't have a wall to plug it into. So if those batteries die, we have to stop everything and change them. Um, and then uh, I'm uncertain on the level of like serviceability to it. But it's at a price point where they probably assume if it breaks, you'll just get a new one. I have a question about the sound devices, kind of random question. Yeah. There are three channels uh, uh, there, and, and you mentioned that uh, obviously you can, apply, you can apply phantom power. Is that on all three channels at the same time, or it can do individual? You can apply phantom power to all three full-size XLR at once. Or, they, they, you, could, you, could do one channel or you could do individually. Okay. You can go in and you can set e each input has its own independent menu. Okay. And so you could set each one as mic or line with phantom or not independently. That makes a huge difference right there. That's a big... Yeah. And, and keep in mind, too, if you were to just turn on phantom, if you just had a switch that said phantom on or off, you're now sending 48 volts to three outputs. You may be only using one. So that might suck your power, Chris. And so you mentioned there are two auxiliary <coughs> uh, uh, inputs, outputs. Outputs. Yeah. outputs. Uh, what would you use those for? So um, for example, I might use one output um, to send a, an audio, a, a, a feed to a director. And the director might be at Video Village or on a reality shoot. We might have a field producer who needs to be able to, excuse me, who needs to be able to hear what I'm actually mixing. Um, and so I'll send that um, typically over wireless, which would be this and this antenna. Or in this bag, it would be this transmitter. And um, that will send um, a wireless signal to a director who will be holding this, which we call an IFB. And I will give them a pair of headphones. These are 11 bucks a piece on Amazon. They look great. Uh, so, and that matters when you have to give something to a director. Um, and then I might use the other input to send an audio feed to a boom op like Ted when he's booming for me. Ted might want to only hear the boom. He might not want to hear the full mix with all the wireless in because he's not going to know exactly what his boom is doing. So I can select, I can go in and I can route only the boom to go to only, let's say, auxiliary two and I can send that to Ted, and he has his own feed. So that is something, uh, when it comes to having professional equipment, um, that uh, is a, a huge advantage. Um, in a production environment, it, it's completely necessary. Um, syncing sound with camera, um, there are several ways we can do it. Um, the first, uh, um, so uh, very important that it is the sound department's responsibility to sync the sound with the camera. Um, I will say it now, and we will never ask it again. Um, the sound department brings the slate. If you are the sound mixer and you show up without a slate, it is on you. Um, so there are a few ways that we can sync sound. Um, the easiest, um, I mean really the easiest, is hardwire camera. So take an output off your mixer, hardwire camera. So I have this coming from my sound cart over there. And uh, I'm sending audio to the camera. Um, and we can get this type of cable is called a snake. And it breaks out on both ends to uh, if I can get it out. One day, you may use a red. And one day, you may curse 
where they put the connections. Thank you, Canon, for making it so much easier. Um, uh, so on a multi-channel snake like this, we will have a fan out of a left and a right XLR and a headphone. And this headphone, we use as a, uh, uh, we call it a return. So we could plug this into the camera's headphone out. We have a little loop out so that the operator can still listen to a headphone. And we can send the audio back to the mixer. So if I'm sending audio to the camera, I can check on my mixer. I can plug the return into the return input on my mixer. And I can listen to what the camera hears. I can listen to the camera's headphone out. And that's going to give me the confidence that my audio is also being recorded on camera with high quality. These snakes also, if the camera has to move, we have a 25 foot cable attached to it. Well, guess what? We can break it away. And that's great. So we can keep this plugged into the camera. The camera can move. We can just plug it back in with a, a single multi pin locking connector. Um, so that's uh, the other way. Uh, another way that we could send um, audio to the camera is wirelessly um, and with the uh, almost the same or some often exactly the same way that we would use uh, wireless to send uh, to the director. Um, we could also, if we're not going to send um, audio to the camera, that's when we might use a slate um, or just the clap. And the reason we use the clap or the slate is the same thing uh, that the mark gives a common reference point on uh, film. If we watch it, we, see, we can go frame by frame and see exactly when the sticks close. And as we look at the, um, uh, as we look at the audio waveform, we'll see the spike and we match them up. Um, this slate happens to be what we would call a smart slate. It holds time code um, and so we can match the time code visually with the time code that's getting recorded in the audio. We can also send time code to the camera uh, using a device like this, which is basically a very expensive clock. Um, or we could use a combination of all of them, again, for redundancy. Um, we may want to have time code and scratch, um, very common. Uh, last thing I want to do is um, quickly go over um, booming. Uh, so booming is the bane of everyone's existence. Um, there's really no one right way to do it. Um, the wrong way is the way that hurts you. Um, but in general, find a stance that you feel comfortable um, and practice. Uh, so for me, I, I tend to use my right arm as control and counterbalance, while my left arm is more of a pivot point. So if, I, and so if I'm going to boom Chris, I'll come in like this. And if I'm going to go from Chris to Allie, it's going to be my right hand and my right arm that's going to do the movement. So it's going to be that. And if I did the big swing, it's going to come in here. So um, important things when we're booming, we typically want to have a slight angle to the mic. That's going to help us aim at the subject better. Um, so um, we want to make sure that we are aiming at your talent's mouth, not over their head, and not down at their stomach. Um, we often have a tendency when we're doing a student film we're holding the boom and we go like this. That's not really gonna do very much. It's just gonna kinda get the room. Any mic, whether it be a hypercardioid like this one or a shotgun, um, we want to make sure we bring it in one to two feet from our subject. It's a very common misconception that the shotgun is called a shotgun because it reaches farther, it does not. Uh, it's called a shotgun because it looks like the barrel of a shotgun. Um, but what it does do is because it is longer, that's, it has what we call an interference tube, and it rejects more. So it's just more focused. But it still needs to be placed the same distance as we would 
any other mic. So uh, don't slide hands up and down. Makes noise. Shaking makes noise. You're not going to shake when you're recording. It's not going to happen. Um, so the last thing that I want to do, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Yes. So one thing that's also very important for boom pole safety, um, you're probably looking at the mic end of the boom pole, so you know where that's going to be. It's always important to keep a hand on the back end of the boom pole, because if you don't, you might whack somebody behind you that you're not looking at. So always, always, always keep a hand, or at least awareness of where the back end of the boom pole is when booming. Thank you, Ted. That is very important. So the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a little practical bit here, and we're going to practice booming. So I have a few boom poles set up with flashlights. And you will pick, you'll you know, get in, you seem pretty well grouped. Um, you can get a boom pole and take turns trying to keep your subject's face in the light. And it's a really great way to practice. And it's a really cheap way to practice if it's something that you want to do. And, um, and you don't have mic. Um, so, like so. Um, who wants to try? All right. Um, what's your name? Sean. Sean. Would you um, like to be talent? Sure. All right. And what was your name? Ben. Ben. Yes. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. Ben, you're the boom operator. Yes. Sean, you're the talent. Mm -hmm. So come with me. And uh, you know, let's switch. So all right. So you're going to find a comfortable position. And you're going to boom Sean as he walks down towards me and tells me how he came here today. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that our mic is one to two feet away from our subject and that we're aiming it at his mouth. Perfect. So you are going to follow, Ben, you're going to follow Sean with the boom as Sean walks towards me. All right. So, so you fell behind. Yeah. And that's fine. And it takes a lot of practice. And so you would have had the luxury, most likely, of a rehearsal or watching a blocking. So what might you have just discovered now? That I should move it back this way instead of trying to move it along right. the side of him to like, keep it just in the same space, maybe move myself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, You could maybe even start a little further back reach out a little further, and then come in as he comes closer. All right, so try, try it one more time, and then we'll break up into groups. Yeah, much better. Much better. And as you practice, you, great. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so um, as you practice, you'll get better at walking with the boom. You'll get better at knowing your surroundings. Um, and. Uh, we all trip a little sometimes. Um, so, um, what's that? Oh yeah, I tripped over roots. I've like put my foot into rabbit holes. I've fallen over chairs. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. If you haven't wiped out camera operating or boom operating, you just haven't done it enough. Um, all right. So, uh, all right. Group one. Ted, do we have another? All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can do this. Okay. While you're setting this up, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever been on a set doing sound recording and found that there was noise in the signal that uh -huh. you could not figure out where it came from? And did you panic or it and or did you, are you uh, capable of 
stopping the you know the process and saying it's impossible or it is up to you to make a judgment call about whether or not the audio will at all be usable or if it's truly a waste of time. Um, most of the time, you're going to have to just go with it if you can't troubleshoot it. Um, you're going, the, the most important thing is to make production aware. Talk to your AD if you're on a reality, or if, you're on, if you're on a scripted set, talk to the field producer if you're on a reality set. Um, make sure that they're aware that you're having a problem. Um, they don't care about the details. It's just, <laughs> I'm having a problem and I, I can't figure it out right now. And they're going to ask you, well, uh, are we screwed? And you're going to say yes or no. Try to say no, but be honest. Um, a word on troubleshooting, start small. Um, Check that everything is plugged in. Check that everything has power. Check that, check, you know, work from the mic down. Um, if you're not getting signal on your mic, don't freak out going into your mixer menus and saying something, a setting must be off. So often you just, your cable fell out. It happens. Just check the little things. It makes such a big difference. What's the best possible sound, maybe? Huh? Yeah, um, so something that uh, is, is really important. How do I turn this on now, Ted? I got it. <laughs> um, so uh, our job as a production sound mixer is to get the best possible sound that we can on set. Every, there are limitations no matter where we go, no matter what we're doing. And, and perfect sound is just too often impossible. Um, and so... Assuming that, group three, assuming that, um, don't freak out when you have a problem. Um, do the best you can. It's going to go to the post department anyway. Don't count on the post department, but they can, they can do some pretty magical things. Um, get the best sound you can. You're not going to stop a highway. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, and then... My last slide, and then we'll take two minutes practicing booming, is always listen. When you're the sound mixer, your headphones are on. You're listening critically. You're listening actively. And it's your job to know that what you are supposed to be recording is getting recorded. Um, I, it, it, it can be a little odd because people think you're the sound mixer, so you heard all the dialogue, and you probably didn't. It's really weird. Um, I don't listen to dialogue. I mean, I do, but I'm listening to the quality of the audio. I mean, is, it, is it right? The level is right. Um, is, is, is it clean? Is it noise-free? Um, and if you're not listening for that, um, then that is job number one. Um, so uh, let's just take two minutes, stand up with whoever you're next to, and you can kind of get a feel of what it's like to get the boom where it should be and, and uh, um, how you might move with it. Basically, what I'm going to do is uh, play a, a, few, a few examples, uh, you know, a few recent projects that I've had. Um, they're short. Um, one of them was a documentary that I uh, shot on a Canon C100 Mark II. Um, I'm going to unplug this for a second, sorry. The first thing that I'm going to show is something that I did uh, uh, a couple days ago. Uh, we were recording a DJ. Uh, he's running through a new routine. And uh, this is just a teaser, but um, really, I. I had a lot of fun doing this. It was, you know, very simple lighting setup, and uh, it's kind of cool. I think it's, I think it's a cool look. So, all right, here we go. Yeah. This. 
That's pretty much it. But uh, just to, you know, it's short enough where I feel like I can run through a lighting setup uh, really quickly and show you what that was about. Um, the beginning uh, was really fun to do. See how he steps out of the blackness into the light? All that was was a two-foot, two-bank fluorescent fixture rigged above him on a stand. It was boomed out about four or five feet above him. I skirted it with duvetine so that there's no spill of light. It's just hitting his turntable and then the top of his head and his shoulders. Then we move on to this setup. At this point, I've taken away the overhead fixture and I've turned on these two three-quarter backlights. They are uh, tungsten Fresnels, 650-watt light fixtures, um, you know, relatively large sources, especially in this space, and just hit them right in the back of the head for a really dramatic, nourish look. And because they are somewhat large sources, there's enough wrap where you can, uh, you know, the light can sort of reach around to the front of his face a little bit so he's not completely gone. Um, so that was, that was that little bit, and then the rest of this is just good fun. I just pan the light, do a shadow on the wall, and yeah. So, so didn't really have any, I guess, I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty much self-explanatory, but if you have any questions, feel free. Um, and then this next piece is uh, the, it's a short, well, okay. Over the summer, I uh, helped shoot a documentary um, for a Sepultec artist. He is a traditional Sepultec uh, weaver, and uh, this was for the Smithsonian, um, spe specifically the National Museum of the American Indian. And uh, this is just something that I cut together. It's not, it's not the documentary itself. But I, um, you know, was communicating with the director, and uh, you know, it was fine to to show this for the purposes of today's talk. But mainly, what what I wanted to talk about here um, is just sort of the strengths of shooting with such a small camera uh, in a documentary setting like this, and uh, you know, it's it's just working with available light, and, and it's it's really cool what, what you know you're able to do. So, uh, yeah, here we go. My name is Porfirio Gutierrez. I'm a descendant of many generations of Zapotec weavers from Teotitlan del Valle, Oaxaca, Mexico. My family and I are proud to be master Zapotec weavers. Thank you guys so much. It's an honor. Yeah. So that was shot in the C100 Mark II, which we have in the back of the room here today. Um, and of course, Liz you know, is, uh, can answer any questions that you have about the camera. Um, definitely recommend checking it out. Um, but this, this was shot, you know, I, I was, it was a one, one man crew, uh, you know, and I didn't have any lights. Uh, and it was, it was really just a matter of chasing the light. And, 
you know, finding interesting compositions and uh, uh, working with what you got to uh, come up with a compelling visual story um, and narrative. Um, and I thought, it, I thought it turned out all right. And, uh, you know, it was two long days, but when you're working with a camera like that, it weighs less than four pounds with a lens. Um, I didn't break a sweat all day. And so there's definitely, uh, it's not quite like going out into the field with one of these, and which I think requires a whole, pro a whole different kind of production environment. Um, so uh, yeah, just, just kind of a demo of some of the capabilities of what cameras can do today. And then the last bit uh, is a segment from um, a video that Ted directed uh, for the 24 Speed Alumni Film Competition. And uh, I think this is just a, a great example of guerrilla filmmaking. Uh, uh, so here we go. You got what I ordered? Yeah, I got it. This is your first tactical mission? Look, don't worry. You got a whole team backing you up. You're gonna be just fine. All right, just follow my lead. You locked and loaded? Man, I love this job. Looks like everything's in order. I'll have my boys bring your payment. Package is on site. Unit 20092012, breach, breach, breach. Looky, we're up. Let's do this. Guess it ain't about that life. Shut up. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> oh. But just to take it back for a minute, the first thing you'll notice is a sound device's 302 mixer. Not a part of this discussion, but we do have it here. Uh, and that was a cool film prop. Um, but what I really enjoyed uh, about doing this with, with Ted, you know, again, on a super tight time schedule, not a lot of help, um, is, you know, we wanted to shoot a surveillance scene uh, in a car. And it, how do you do that at night uh, with, you know, I, I had two lights. That was it. And uh, so what we ended up doing is basically using both lights. I gelled one blue, gelled the other um, a, street, a street light color. Specifically, it was Urban Vapor, uh, which is a, uh, it's a Roscoe gel that is uh, designed to imitate street lamps. Um, and what you get is basically a 250 watt source, maybe four feet behind her, three or four feet behind her, sitting her in the back of the head. And it kind of maybe looks like moonlight in a filmic world. I think. And uh, on the reverse shot is the 650, um, also behind him, but motivating a you know, potential street light. And that was it. Um, that was all that we had to work with there. I think it worked out all right. And then once we moved into the tunnel, we didn't have any lights. The only lights that we had was, uh, I think, an LED light panel that we could use as a backlight just to separate our subject from the background. But really what made the scene work was using the practical fixtures that were in the tunnel. And so it was important to stage the action near um, a key source of light uh, that was already there, just waiting to be shot. And uh, you know, again, this awesome backdrop of just crazy city urban light um, really helped. So you don't need, you don't, you, you know, there, there are ways of I guess working smarter uh, and definitely maximizing uh, your surroundings and the equipment that you have to uh, uh, pull, pull things off. 
uh, or get away with a look. So, yeah, that's that's it for me. Um, if you guys have any questions, by all, okay. Did you put the lights inside the car or outside the car? Uh, outside the car. Were you filming inside the car or outside? The car? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to do was uh, with the camera it, is definitely make it feel like I wasn't shooting from outside the car. I wanted I wanted to feel like you were there with them. And so what I would do is I would ask, um, you know, for the singles, I would ask our talent to step out and I would take their place. Um, and then there, there was a two shot where, um, you know, you could see them both in the frame, but I was, I was very close to them. And the lights, you know, the, the, the larger source, I was able to back it off 10, 15 away, uh, 10 or 15 feet away from the car. Uh, and then the other one was pretty close. So, uh, go ahead. On such a tight deadline, did you, what kind of grading did you do, if any? Like, did you shoot super flat and then grade, or did you try to get it right in camera? Yes, yeah, so we shot this on the Sony F3 and the Panasonic GH4. Um, on the F3, um, I shot in a uh, expanded uh, gamma. Uh, it's, it's called S-Log. Um, so you do get expanded dynamic range. Um, but as far as the color correction goes, really it was just, it was just a pure correction. So um, I, I added contrast, made sure the blacks were black and other sources looked right. Um, but yeah, not, nothing, nothing too much. Uh, you know, you, you, you expose for it and then you just sort of bring it back. Um, and with the GH4, I was able to put, I didn't shoot in V-Log, which is their version of, of sort of like the, their equivalent of S-Log, um, but I just picked a flat picture profile. I got it to look as close as I could in camera to my F3, and um, I was able to very easily match him. So if, if we were to look at which one is the, so th all of this is the Sony footage, and then the opening shot to this is the GH4, that we set up on Ted's, I think, 10 or $15, $20 slider rig that he built. And you know, that's just the benefit of using a camera that, that is so small, you can, you can pull off something like that, which I wouldn't, you know, the F3 isn't quite this large, but it, it, there's just no way you need more serious gear. Also, just a, a note on if, to do stuff like color grading and something like 24 speed, uh, division of labor becomes really important. So basically, like I got the movie done, pickles for picture lock, and threw it off to Chris while I was like working on credits because I knew the credits wouldn't need to be color graded because they were in black and white. So I was basically able. I focused on getting the movie picture lock, shooting that off to Chris. Chris was able to color correct while I'm working on credits. Yeah, and it's really good to have sort of if you have multiple skilled members of your team at those fields to split it, split up the work that way. The color correction for me, it took, a, it took less than an hour. Like I had less than an hour to do. And uh, what, what really helped in, in, in doing that is basically having your scopes. And all I was, I didn't have time to make subjective decisions. I just basically looked at the waveform and uh, got my you know, shadows where I wanted them to be. And you know, as long as it looked like a healthy waveform, that was fine. And then for the vector scope, uh, I brought the saturation to a Rec 709 compliant like space and called it a day. That was, that was basically it. Right. Um, was there like a deliberate intention between switching the Panasonic and Sony during different shots? <coughs> Say that again? Oh, was there a um, deliberate intention when switching between the Sony and the Panasonic? The, uh, just, just to get, we wanted, we wanted a slidey, like a, a slider shot to open the scene uh, and that I couldn't have done that with the F3 because of the size, and so uh, you know it was just the right tool, for, right tool for the shot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's something definitely to consider. Like it's it's great having a camera this small. Um, you know, again with the C100 Mark II, you know, just to keep a small footprint, a small production footprint. You know, you, you can do some great things that way. And now there's other sta stabilizing rigs and things like that where having such a small, basically the smaller the equipment that you have, the less stuff that you have to take out. And so you can work faster. Um, but yeah, D does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. You mentioned looking at the scopes and waveform mm -hmm. in post. When yep. you're shooting something, um, you have, have those instruments that you're using I do. live as well? Yeah, I do. So. Um, Basically, there's a sound, it's, a, it's made by sound devices. They're, they have a subsidiary called Video Devices. And uh, there's a production recorder and monitor. There's another one here. 
This is the, the bigger brother of that unit. And it has all of those scopes built in to the device. So I can pull up a waveform vectorscope, RGB parade, um, all those things. And, and I'm definitely monitoring those when I'm in the field. Uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm not clipping information um, and that I'm, I'm exposing the image where I want it to be. So. Is that sort of uh, expertise or objective monitoring you've learned? Obviously, you didn't learn it here, but I mean, you learned it on. Yeah, you know, it's that's that's the you know, scopes. Uh, I definitely recommend learning about them. There's tons of information about them on the internet. It's it's just like a few minutes of reading about them, and and then just seeing for yourself what what they do. While you're here, walk up to a camera and uh, change the exposure of the camera and see how a waveform changes. Um, and uh, you know, we can definitely walk you through that process. Um, but one thing that I have found is I have learned, I've learned to separate what I do. Uh, so there's, there's the technical aspect of filmmaking and then there's a the subjective aspect of filmmaking and I've learned to identify what I need technically to accomplish something and then I walk away from that mentally and I then think about what I'm looking at and I adjust to taste. So it's, it's important to identify the tools that you need to get a job done, but at that point, you're set up and you're good to go. Don't worry about it. Just go and make the movie. So, yeah. I think, uh, I think something that uh, Chris touched on with your question uh, is that it's about the right tool for the job. And so we can look at different cameras. We can say, oh, well, they shot on RED, they shot on Alexa, they shot on GH4, they shot on C300, C500. Um, but um, we all make those choices uh, for a reason. And, and um, we get very tempted to kind of like pick whatever the hot new camera is. But the truth is that they all make beautiful pictures now. Yep. If you know what you're doing, um, and if you take the time to learn, they all make beautiful pictures. And digital has kind of gotten to a point where um, each camera kind of has its own <coughs> film stock. Where we used to say, okay, well, I want to shoot this on Kodak or on Fuji. Now we're like, oh, okay, well, I want to shoot this on Canon because of the color that those cameras have. Because I want to use the lenses that are available to me. Um, so we don't, you know, it, it, so many cameras now, and they're coming out so quickly. Um, especially in the camera world, you really have to focus on the craft, um, I think, more than the tech. Like Chris said, get, get the understanding of the tech. That'll move from camera to camera and, and job to job. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I, I feel like I haven't really uh, said enough, though. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, working with the, the, the Canon C100 Mark II. Um, that was... That was a lot of image packed into a very small, you know, form factor. Right. So how do you compare? So I know you, because I've worked with you before. I know you worked with the DSLRs before. How does working on something like a Canon Team 100, which is designed for for filmmaking, compare to working on a DSLR? Yeah. So, uh, well, really, the the main thing is just having certain professional tools. So, like the comparison between. That, that Matt made between the 63 Sound Devices Mixer to the H4 and Zoom. Um, there are things that a Canon C100 Mark II offer um, that make doing your job easier and more reliable uh, in the field versus on the DSLR. Um, things like you know, your scopes, monitoring your image. Um, you have built-in neutral density filters to, to, to help you compensate for exposures. Um, you know, uh, you can get good you can get good sound on your camera, um, so things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. Uh, like I said uh, before, I, I did start in camera. Sorry. Oh, it's, okay. Uh, I did start in camera, and um, uh, last June. 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 Um, uh, Chris, Ted, and I all worked on a uh, feature film together. Um, and uh, I was the director of photography, Chris was my assistant camera, and Ted mixed it. And um, it was an experience. Uh, we shot this feature in a week. 
Um, so talk about um, talk about time crunch. Um, so Chris is editing it now too, and he's pulled a few selects for me, um, and I may just uh, scrub a little bit. Um, so uh, the film is called Violet. Um, no, just let's just put it no, like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hit play here. This is an exterior. <laughs> So um, we had Chris on Steadicam doing the pull around from the car. Uh, but what I really want to point out is the separation here. So we're shooting an exterior, um, but um, there's a fair bit of light going on. We actually have a, a 2K Fresnel, 2000 watt, coming out of a window way up here. And that's giving this edge light. Uh, and what that edge light is also doing is it's separating um, our foreground from our background. We're maintaining the action um, in, in both, so um, we're really kind of killing two birds with, with one stone in this shot. Um, but uh, for me, it, it, I think it's just a, a good example of, um, of shooting uh, an exterior that's dynamic and, and that is um, showing a few things at once. Um, this is probably my favorite shot from the movie. It's really simple, but I really like it. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's a trick um, that we did. We were uh, actually trying to find a way to have the characters enter the scene. Um, and I knew they needed to get to this flower pot. Um, and uh, the scene plays on, and they find a clue. The, it's like, it's um, sort of a horror kind of sci fi uh, thriller. Um, and there's a clue underneath these flowers. So we needed to get them to the flower pot, fl flower pot and get them into the room. And um, we put the camera down, and I saw that we could get this door to the kitchen angled in a way that it would reflect the front door. And so to make it a mirror, we hung a sheet of duvetine, uh, just black fabric, behind the door. So there's, you don't see anything through the glass. You only see what the glass is reflecting. Uh, and so we get um, the trick of where they're coming from. Um, so we see them enter from outside, and then they actually walk all the way through a hallway before entering the kitchen, all from this one shot. So I just want to replay it. I really like it. So they're moving. I just think it's, I think it's interesting how we had them. The trick is that they're entering from, um, from screen right, but they physically enter the room from screen left. Um, so what else have we pulled here? The There's the grandma scare. Um, I really like this conversation, um, talking about their, uh, this old woman who knew their dead grandmother. And they've come to clean out grandma's house, which is haunted. Uh, but uh, we shot this whole seen on a 16 millimeter prime lens and just got way up close. Can I get you tea or anything? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> she never missed morning mass with Father Jacob. 
behind me something was on foot. I was she here with the camera. When she didn't answer, I called the police right away. I don't understand someone so obsessed with heaven commit suicide. He was in a lot of pain before she died. She was seeing things. Like what? Oh, like uh, <laughs> shadows and lights. Um, yeah. So I mean, we we had we had fun with that, um, and uh, um, just as as a general point, when you're shooting conversations, be sure to match your eye lines. Uh, that will be critical. Um, you see, when we go back between, um, it it's clear who they're looking at because they both look in uh, you know in, in the different direction. If we had them on the same screen side, it would just look like a different shot or that they're both sitting next to each other. Um, night exteriors, big 2K Fresnel bounce. And what's great about this is I let this with two lights. I let this with a 2K Fresnel and I let this with a single Kino flow um, and a little generator. Um, so what the digital technology has given us today is the ability to have extremely sensitive cameras uh, that can work in low light, uh, that can pull off shots that we simply couldn't do before. Um, we, like I said, we shot this in a week. Um, we had lights, we had a small crew, um, but uh, you know, I, I still, especially this scene, this was a pickup day. This was day seven. Um, and uh, we had two people. Um, we had me and an AC, and it turned out that I rolled sound, and the AC operated after I set up the shot. Um, so if it, if it wasn't for how far the digital cameras have come, um, it just wouldn't be possible. Um, and that, that's great for the art. Um, it really is. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm going to show this, which gives some nod to Chris and his steady cam action, which is a little jumpy. <laughs> and then again, 16 millimeter close ups. He's been asleep for a long time. It's time to get up and find the next clue. Memories of the past, lost and forgotten. It's the attic, duh. Um, and then uh, Chris really loves this, um, and so do I. Uh, again, we're outside, but now we're a night exterior. We have steady cam. So um, this is a great example for motivating light. Um, we have a fair bit of lights here. We have a 4K HMI working right now on its own generator. This is very bright. Um, if you actually were to look at the waveform, we have a really good signal level. Um, but in cinematography, darkness is relative. Everything is as dark as your brightest bright. And so that's how we can watch a movie like Prometheus and go into the caves and still see things. We have the detail, it's there, but it has the illusion of darkness um, because we have the dynamic range to do it. And so here, we see all of the detail, we see the car, we see the face, um, but it's so much darker than this. And this is going to be our benchmark for brightness. What this also does is it motivates a rather large light to be over here to come down and give our backlight and the wrap over to the face. So because we have that motivation, um, we're, we're able to light a subject. And we accept that. We accept that. I mean, there's, there's simply no way that lights on the side of a door are going to be this bright in real life. But we can use it as a photographer and, and motivate our other sources. Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to show is 
this scene. I really like this because um, we get a lot of depth. Um, because we have the dynamic range in the cameras, um, we're able to see very far into, uh, into the world that we're creating. So we can have open doors and we can just turn on a practical or we can use a single light just to give some atmospheric. And then we have so much more of the environment. Uh, so we can see going all the way back behind those curtains. And there are going to be other angles where you'll see even further. So you can see how far back we go into uh, this dressing room. Um, and that's just a single little light that's on. And here we have great use of practical soft box. She's using that lampshade. Lamp shade. And that's the scene. So that's my bit on cinematography. So when's this movie coming out again? Uh, ask Chris, he's cutting it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a while. Chris, it'll be a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, so thank you again. Uh, thank you. Before we, before we uh, break up or leave, or if you're not, you, can, you can certainly stay here, I would really recommend uh, current students to connect with these guys. I, they can give you their phone number, email address. They're very friendly and helpful people. So definitely uh, feel free to connect with these guys. And uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to know people. Yep. And thank you again, uh, Troy, Media Center employees. Thank you. Coffee Sound, Sound Devices. Canada, Canada. Virginia, Virginia thank you so much. Really nice. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to ask you about that later. <laughs>